All righty. Um, well, good afternoon. On behalf of the Grape Growers of Ontario, Ontario Tender Fruit Growers and Ontario Apple Growers, thank you for joining us as we provide important information as all of you are beginning the 2021 growing season already has begun. And <clears throat> before we begin, uh, I'd like to share some protocols to ensure that we move along smoothly this afternoon. Everybody, as you can see, is on mute. That's so that we can eliminate any background noise. If you have a question, uh, we would ask you to utilize the uh, question and answer. Uh, and we will add, uh, then uh, Sarah Marshall and uh, Kelly will, you know, at the end of the session, bring some questions for session for a couple of questions, but we'll have a, a much more time at the end for questions. The questions we don't get to, we will have email responses. And uh, uh, we also will make sure that the, uh, the whole session is being taped and it will be posted on everybody's uh, website and each organization's website in a couple of days from now. We will hear from a number of agencies this afternoon and from making themselves available and joining us to provide these important updates. But today we will start, uh, today was hearing from, our, from a staunch supporter for Ontario's agriculture, the Honorable Ernie Hardeman. Minister Hardeman has been the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs since June, 2018 and he was also minister from 1999 to 2001. He was first elected as MPP for Oxford in 1995 and is now the longest serving MPP in Oxford's history. All of our organizations have a well-established and long-standing relationship with Minister Hardeman and we thank him for that. I want to take this opportunity to wish him all the best for 2021. I know it's a little late but I know it's going to be another busy season. We are grateful for his ongoing commitment to Ontario's food and beverage industries and for recognizing that these unprecedented times highlight the importance in a local agriculture economy. Minister Hardeman, welcome on behalf of all of us and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh for the uh, for the kind introduction and it is a, a, a deep privilege to be able to uh, uh, to join you today while i would be great to see each of us in person of course um, uh, we uh, we're glad that we have the technology to be able to do it virtually and i uh, i've said this at a number of these events i find it so great that um, though it's it's um it's what we call a half measure when you we have to do it uh, uh, virtually rather than in person but um, if we all do it properly, um, you can all uh, look at me on the screen and see this as a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I can assure you that if it wasn't for the virtuality of it, uh, if we did this at a regular meeting, um, I would be in front of a, a host of a whole room full of people and there would only be one or two who really believed or thought that I was speaking directly to them. So and maybe maybe there's some positive side to this. They, uh, they always say uh, that's the, the half full analogy rather than half empty. So uh, we, uh, we very much appreciate it. I wanna take this time to thank the Ontario Grape Growers Ontario's tender fruit producers and the Ontario apple growers for your hard work during the COVID outbreak. You ensure that Ontarians continue to have access to high local quality fruit. I truly admire what you have been able to accomplish given the challenges with access to labor and all the work that comes with the need to make sure that your workplaces are safe. This pandemic has shown us the value of our domestic food security cannot be overestimated. Before I begin, I want to discuss the announcement from earlier this week the Premier made on Ontario's state of emergency. There has been some confusion as to whether the new restrictions impact our sector. After healthcare, our sector is the most important industry keeping this province going during the pandemic. The ability to produce process, ship and sell food items is critical. And I want to clarify that the agri-food sector remains open during this state of emergency. 
If you want, if you have construction projects on your farms, you can continue them. And of course, if you have other questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact my ministry and clarify, we are here to help. And I just wanna point out that is really true. Uh, sometimes people get a little nervous when people say I'm from the government and I hear, I'm here to help. Uh, usually um, they don't see that as a positive. I just want to make sure that that is what I'm implying today. We really are here to work with you to help make the industry work. We all know that last year was extremely difficult for Ontario growers. Accessing much needed labor was challenging with temporary foreign workers arriving much later than expected or sometimes not at all. Although we have always been aware of the, importance, the important role that labor plays in our horticulture sectors, this became even more apparent in 2020. As we prepare for 2021 growing season, I can assure you my ministry will continue to work closely with the industry and with all levels of government. To do as much as we can to help farmers and businesses throughout the food supply chain to keep things moving. Here are some of the highlights of our efforts so far. We created a one-stop shop online toolkit for farmers that, that has guidance, resources, and information related to COVID-19 prevention, control, testing, and outbreak management supports. Last year, we added labor as an insured peril for growers enrolled in the production insurance through Agricor. The coverage has been extended to cover 2021 program year and will include fruit trees, grapevines, and bees. As well, our government announced financial relief for farm businesses across the province with a $50 million increase to the risk management program, which includes the self-directed risk management program for edible horticulture. We expanded the program a year earlier than planned for a total of $150 million annually, and we are transitioning it into transitioning it to ensure that in times of crisis, farmers will get better protection. We launched the Enhanced Agri-Food Workplace Protection Program. The program helps farmers to build workplace safety enhancements, such as building barriers for work separation, upgrading the, HV, uh, the HVAC systems, as well as providing PPE and temporary alternative housing arrangements. It provides support for isolation expenses and workers' wages when a farm business experiences an outbreak. And it covers costs incurred to support the health and safety of workers who are unable to return home due to the COVID-19 travel restrictions. We also committed $25.5 million to help minimize the COVID exposure risk in the workplace and support the province's food supply chain through the Agri-Food Prevention and Control Innovation Program. Maintaining the health and safety of our agri-food workers is critical to those to those efforts and I encourage everyone in our sector to do their part of keeping our system going. Make sure of these costs, make, make use of these cost shared programs to improve health and safety standards on your farms to keep not just your workers safe, but your families and our communities safe too. I know labor remains a constant challenge across the sector and that concerns are being raised about what this means for the upcoming growing season but we are making progress. As you know, together last November, we launched the prevention, prevention control and outbreak support strategy for COVID-19 in Ontario's farm workers. Your organization played a key role in the development of the strategy and I look forward to implementing the strategy along your side with you. Working together, the aim is to prevent and contain COVID-19 outbreaks in the agri-food workplace protect agri-food workers while respecting their rights and freedoms, and to maintain the sustainability of the agri-food sector. I know many of you have already taken steps and put in place changes to protect the health and wellness of your workers. Your actions will help reduce the spread of COVID-19 on farms, agri-food workplaces, and in, groups live in group living quarters so that our workers are kept safe and disruptions to the agri-food sector are minimized to the best of our ability. This work couldn't have happened without everyone pulling together and its successful implementation depends on the work that is continuing. As I look ahead, I'm certainly confident in the agriculture sector's ability to tackle tough challenges. 
Today's meeting is an opportunity for the fruit industry to plan and prepare for your labor needs for the upcoming season. I know that AMAFRA and the Ontario grape growers and the Ontario tender fruit growers and the Ontario apple growers will keep working together to address labor challenges and ensure stability, recovery and growth in the fruit industry in the months and years ahead. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you today and keep up the great work and hopefully uh, keep up the communication so we can help you with that great work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hardiman. Um, you know, your efforts have, are, have been greatly appreciated for keeping our workers, our colleagues and our families safe. Um, it's been terrific work that you've done and, and all, all of us appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Um, our next speaker, a lifelong resident of Niagara, Sam Osterhoff, serves as MP for Niagara West and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Education. First elected to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario in November 2016, Sam has been a champion of local issues in Niagara, including the concerns of grape, tender fruit, and apple growers. A great local supporter. Sam? Thank you very much, uh, Phil. I want to thank you for uh, inviting both myself and Minister Hardiman to bring greetings on behalf of the Government of Ontario, uh, the Grape Growers of Ontario, the Ontario Tender Fruit Growers, and the Ontario Apple Growers provide essential uh, work in our province. They are incredible contributors to our economy and to our social fabric here in the Niagara region, one of the things that truly defines this area. Um, I know that uh, as of 2016, which I believe are the latest numbers that we have available, uh, the uh, re region of Niagara was responsible for over $1.4 billion in gross domestic product uh, in the agricultural area. Uh, that's 42% of the gross farm receipts from the Golder, Great, Greater Golden Horseshoe. That's a significant portion, almost half of the, of the gross farm receipts from the entire Golden Horseshoe uh, come from Niagara. And I know a substantial portion of that when it comes to value added agriculture is in your sectors. You provide uh, incredible amount of bang for your buck, if you will. And uh, that's something that matters a great deal to uh, the people of Ontario and, and to also, of course, a strong economy that we, we need to see going forward. Uh, I want to thank you all for your hard work and community spirit as you face the challenges of COVID-19. I've heard from many of you about how challenging and difficult this year has been and your sacrifices have been truly uh, remarkable. I want to acknowledge uh, that it, although there's been a, a number of sector specific initiatives that have been underway, both from Minister Hardiman uh, and from other areas, I want to also highlight in this challenging time of, of, of uh, shutdown, three key business supports that the government has made available in the context of the enhanced provincial shutdown, including the small business, pro the small business support grant, uh, which is up to $20,000 and no strings attached supports for businesses impacted uh, by the restrictions of COVID-19 uh, with, with employees between one to nine employees, uh, as well as the property tax and energy rebate program, uh, which ensures that there are rebates in the shutdown areas for those, uh, those high expenses, as well as the Main Street Relief Grant, uh, which goes to providing uh, some cost subsidy for PPE in, in order to ensure that you're able to keep yourselves and, and employees safe. We're happy to provide more information on any supports uh, that you, you need as we move forward. I know that the end is in sight. Yesterday was the first day that uh, vaccines arrived in Niagara and we've seen that being rolled out. More and more are gonna be coming in the coming days uh, as we see that, uh, that process unfold. And so I just wanna end by thanking you for the work that you do uh, to promote and expand fruit production in our province. Fruit is truly a, a remarkable piece of uh, the agricultural space here. I have a lot of family from uh, Alberta, northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan and parts of Manitoba. They, they don't quite have the same output that we do when it comes to some of these, uh, these important uh, commodities. And so I want to just assure you of our, our desire to be partners uh, and I look forward to working with you. We are here to help if there's ever anything we can do. Uh, best greetings for Fruitful 2021. Thank you, Sam. Um, it's my pleasure to thank you for joining us today and uh, welcome you and Minister Hardiman to this webinar. It's important as we get into 2021 that we um, 
approach it with the same kind of vigor way we did when we were forced with the shutdown. But I, I want to echo the comments of, uh, of my colleagues and saying that your response, uh, especially through the minister, minister's office and the Ministry of Agriculture has been tremendous. The meetings that we were able to participate in and offer our um, direction on how our industry should be able to respond to the needs of the province, I think has been was was well received by by the, your ministry and your support, Sam. And you I mean, I don't need to repeat what other people have already said. You have a you have a passion for agriculture, particularly. You've been very supportive to the Grape Growers of Ontario, and we uh, thank you very much for being part of this today. I know you're very busy, both of you, but it's important to see your recognition of of uh, agriculture, which we think as you well know, drives the economy for the province of Ontario. So thanks for being here. It is my pleasure now to welcome Gillian Diltz, the Acting Manager of Environmental Health from the region of Niagara, who is also, uh, they've also been tremendously um, important as part of our um, temporary foreign worker program and keeping people safe. So uh, Gillian, welcome. Um, she's with the region of Niagara's Public Health Department. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, everyone, uh, for having me this afternoon. So I thought I'd just provide a very brief update um, in terms of where things are at uh, for Niagara Region um, with the inspection process. So in terms of inspections, all of our 2020 housing inspections have been uh, completed. We no longer have a backlog of um, inspection requests in our system. Uh, so in total, that was 638 inspections in, in 2020. Um, so the inspectors were very busy with the majority of those inspections happening from our uh, September to December time period. Um, we are asking growers to make requests for um, inspections in the next coming months with as much notice as possible. Um, as you can imagine, our current priority is uh, attached with outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes. Um, so we are asking for uh, as much notice as possible and patience. Um, we will definitely get out to, to do the housing inspections um, as quickly as we can, uh, but we're just asking for um, some patience in terms of um, booking those inspections and flexibility um, for scheduling and if there's any need um, in terms of what you need to provide Service Canada, the inspector that is attached to your, your housing inspection uh, can provide you with an email and specific date in terms of when that inspection will happen that can be forwarded off uh, to Service Canada to satisfy that requirement if there is a bit of a time delay from when we can get out to complete that inspection. In terms of um, new arrivals, uh, we are just finalizing our process of what that will look like and um, has already started to be implemented, but uh, definitely will be um, more formalized over the next couple of weeks. So public health inspectors um, within their uh, inspection areas will be making support calls to the growers for new arrivals. Um, at this point, they'll be able to answer any questions, discuss isolation periods, um, talk about wellness checks, safety plans, um, and inspection and order requirements. Uh, so we are asking that you do contact public health through our environmental health information line, which is at 905-688-8248 to report uh, worker arrivals or email us through inspect at niagararegion.ca. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll um, really get that process going over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, so you should be hearing from your area inspectors at that time. Um, I'll also just flag that we have had a large uh, area rotation for all of the inspectors. So um, you may be noticing some new faces out in your areas. So that's it for updates from um, environmental health. We are always available for questions and support. Um, so please continue to reach out to your area public health inspector or through our uh, information line so that we can support you as best we can. Thank you, Jillian, very much uh, for joining us on such a short notice. And we're very thankful for the guidance that uh, that regions, the region's public health unit has provided to us since the beginning of the pandemic. And we look forward to continuing to work with your team. I know you've been very much available to all of us, especially here, the grape growers, um, tender fruit and apple growers, as we have struggled sometimes to figure out where, where we're going, but it, that guidance is very much appreciated. So thanks for joining us today. It's now uh, my pleasure to welcome Bradley Shaw, the manager of, of CAP, the coordination 
in the Rural Programs Branch at the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs to provide an update on the Enhanced Agri-Food Workplace Protection Program, followed by Scott Duff, who is the Director of Economic Policy, uh, Development Policy at OMAFRA. Scott has been with the Ontario Public Service since 2002 and holding uh, positions in OMAFRA and the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. And today uh, we'll also pro provide an update on the minister's sector leadership group and housing committee. So I'm Brad I think Bradley, you're gonna go first. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Can you just confirm that you can see the the presentation? Yeah, okay, great. So I'm um, just following on on uh, the minister's uh, comments specifically now about the Enhanced Agri-Food Workplace Protection Program. Um, it's been in place now, but has continued to grow and evolve as we've had a better idea about uh, the needs of the sector and, and what uh, what's going on uh, on the ground since it was first introduced uh, in, uh, in the spring. Uh, it now uh, covers four categories and uh, I'll go through those uh, individually in a moment, but uh, just overarching, what, what's the intent here? We're, we know that uh, each of you has had to make changes on your farms and your operations, whether those are physical or process changes uh, in order to deal with the current crisis. And we know that those have uh, involved extraordinary costs that um, are not were never planned uh, before you went into last growing season and, and uh, even uh, perhaps going into the next one. So, um, but we also know that what those costs are, what those uh, those things are you need to do on your farm, uh, it's you who, who know what's on the ground and, and what uh, what needs to be done to uh, to ensure the safety of your workers, obviously in cooperation and, and coordination with uh, with public health authorities and so on. So um, there, uh, this is a, a project where you are able to look for partial or full reimbursement of those expenses that you've had to had to uh, to cover uh, over the course of the year, retroactive back to the to middle of March when when all of this started. Um, and, uh, and it's not a, it's not a pre approval it's a reimbursement uh, to those things that you know you've had to do uh, in order to, to make sure that, that you meet your commitments to your workers. Um, in terms of then how some guidance just a, a brief comment um, for those of you who are, who are looking for more support. Um, I know the Minister uh, mentioned our toolkit which tries to pull together information from a number of different sources and is available on OMAFRA's website. Um, also, uh, we have an arrangement with Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, um, a, uh, which uh, many of you may be familiar with, to get to provide one-on-one -on -one consulting and support. Um, so, if you're looking for some guidance and want to know, you know, this is my condition on my farm individually, um, you know, what's the best way to go? They're still available and, uh, to provide that one-on-one -on -one consulting support. You just need to, to give them a shout. But. This program uh, takes into account that you've, you've got those plans, you know what you want to do, you've gone ahead and done them because it needs to get done, um, but now you've got these bills, right? Um, two of the categories that we now have are, are L for everybody, open uh, for, for everybody, and, and, uh, and we'll go into those details. Two of them are for very specific situations, um, and so it would be a, a smaller a group of people that might be, uh, be eligible for those. Um, key on, on this slide is the dates. Um, so this program uh, currently is in line for this fiscal year. Uh, that's uh, both provincially and uh, this is a federal, uh, the, the federal government is also included uh, in that, uh, is now funding uh, this program partially. So um, claims for the program uh, need to be submitted by the end of February. So that's important to know now. That's only about two months away. Um, and, uh, but they are retroactive, again, as I said, back to March the 15th. So, uh, you know, get those receipts out, get those claims in. Uh, we are working to process uh, submissions as they come in as quickly as possible. Just flag uh, one additional uh, federal requirement that was introduced once uh, once the federal government came on board in, in October. Um, there is a requirement as part of the application to include your safety plan. So um, what are the risks on your farm uh, in terms of COVID transmission and, and what are you planning on doing about it? Uh, not intended to be uh, an, an onerous exercise, um, but I would flag it for you um, because, you know, not only is it just generally a good idea, um, but, um, it also really does help to expedite the the uh, the assessment of those applications. Um, the uh, the kinds of expenses that could be covered are are quite uh, general, but though specific to COVID nineteen. So maybe as something as simple in your operation as uh, you know some additional masks. You didn't your 
your employees didn't need masks before, now they do, um, might be something as complicated as uh, you need to introduce new equipment in your uh, in your on-farm packing line because um, the way you're configured right now doesn't allow for physical distancing, right? And those obviously different magnitudes uh, of, of complication. And some of those expenses, um, uh, because the focus here really is, is in dealing with COVID-19, um, without you having identified those in your plan as, as part of the approach that you're taking, it, it, it makes the assessment a little more difficult. And I'll give you a, a key example. Uh, we got in one submission that was for a load of gravel. That was, that was the only expense. <laughs> That's all that came in. Um, that load of gravel could have been used for anything. But if very simply in the, in the, in the prevention, in the plan, uh, you had said, you know what, I need to, to add, uh, so I, I don't have, I only have enough space for, for uh, six workers under new guidelines and physical distancing in my bunkhouse, I need to add an extra uh, room. Uh, and, the, and then, you know, the gravel is part of that, that that uh, construction process to add to uh, to expand that bunkhouse, um, then clearly there's a logic there, uh, and then that that application flows through. But um, without the support of those couple of sentences in in the prevention plan that kind of uh, lays out what what your plan is, uh, it makes it a little difficult, more difficult to assess, and that just takes longer for you to get the money that uh, that you would be eligible for. So uh, going in now to the four, uh, the four categories that are currently in place, the fourth of those actually was just uh, released the material uh, yesterday, actually. Um, so, uh, so it's hot off the press. Um, but uh, occupational health and safety measures, again, the one that uh, has been there since the beginning um, for, for smaller investments. Uh, worker wages and isolation expenses, that is specifically targeted to farms that have had um, either an outbreak or have been required to isolate workers because of contact with someone who, uh, who had an outbreak. Um, so that's uh, specific to that group of, of farmers. Um, the Farm Worker Safety Improvement Program for larger uh, investments, things that uh, are uh, like, um, you know, small capital investments, uh, you know, those extensions uh, to a bunkhouse, for example, which I talked about. Um, also, you know, a little bit larger changes to your operations, like if you have a large training expense, you've got new, new protocols uh, for, your, uh, for your workers. Um, and, uh, and need to, to maybe do some translation or additional, uh, additional training support. That might be another example. Um, and the final uh, was uh, something that came to our attention uh, in, in uh, later uh, last year, uh, where there are a number of temporary farm workers that were unable to return home, even though they were finished uh, work on the farm. Um, and that is, again, specific support for those, uh, for farmers who, who are working with, with employees in that situation. So uh, going on, just uh, the next little bit layer layer of detail here. Um, so mentioned the the first project category, occupational health and safety measures. Now uh, with uh, with the involvement of, of the federal government, uh, we, uh, minister was able to announce that we have increased that up to a maximum of fifteen thousand dollars per year. That's a seventy percent cost share. Um, and again, this is the most general uh, of the categories. There's a wide range of, uh, um, of different expenses that are covered. Again, as long as you are, are able to, to let us know uh, why it's part of your plan. And um, in, in particular, this is the only category that uh, covers disposable PPE. Um, so just a, a flag for that. Project category two, um, again, for worker wages and isolation expenses, this is really targeted to those very specific expenses that are involved with isolation. It can include um, uh, sort of accommodation and, and other sort of ancillary things. So if you, you know, need to isolate someone and the only opportunity you have is to put someone in a hotel, uh, for example, um, that, but uh, it also uh, might include any additional cost you might be to, you know, to make room and, and, and isolate them more effectively on the farm. Um, and in particular, uh, it's been a consistent message um, that we really do in, have encouraged you to, um, to continue to pay workers if they're in isolation, uh, even though they may not be working and make sure that they're not, not bearing the financial brunt um, of, uh, of that isolation order uh, or, uh, or other reason that they may need to be isolated. The, um, there are other supports that, are, that have been made available in particular by the federal government. Um, they may not apply to all workers and, um, <clears throat> um, and but we do uh, you know, have asked that you make the attempt to make 
make use of whatever uh, resources are available or to work with your employees. Obviously, in some cases, it's the employee that applies. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, if, if that doesn't work out, then uh, encouraging to continue to pay your workers and, and uh, through this program, uh, we will reimburse you for, the, for those wage expenses for which you're out of pocket, whether that's the full wage or the, uh, uh, you know, an incremental amount uh, over above, you know, some of those, those other supports. So um, this category, whether it's for those, uh, for the wages or for other sort of related ancillary expenses that are directly um, tied to the isolation, um, the, uh, the, the minister, the premier, and, and now through this, uh, this program have, have, have uh, said that that's 100% reimbursement. There is no cost share there. Our intention is to make sure that um, you know, people are being isolated, that that's being done well and appropriately, um, that these people are safe, um, and that we're, we're containing the, the outbreak. So um, again, that's, a, that's at 100% reimbursement. cover that material. Uh, category, whoops, sorry for that. Category three, um, again, is for those larger uh, projects that, uh, so a minimum project size of $15,000. So that's sort of where the, the first category ends and then this category starts. It's really, um, some, some of those larger things that are gonna have a, a bigger and, and maybe perhaps longer term outlook. Although um, it really is intended for those things that are no brainers, right? The things that you know uh, that you have had to do and that you're out of pocket for, but are, but are fairly significant expenses. Um, um, and as I said, it might be training, it might be changes to your operations, you know, re, uh, realigning uh, packing lines was an example. Um, it may be uh, accommodation uh, related, um, whether infrastructure or whatnot. So. Um, so that's, uh, so that's this category. This is at a 60% cost share um, and uh, up to $100,000. And so uh, there have been, as I said, for each of these, we do have applications in the system. People are, people are applying, but there certainly are resources available. We encourage you uh, to continue to apply. Uh, and again, all of these uh, are retroactive back to March the 15th. So anything that you have had to do uh, along the way, um, you know, make sure that you uh, that you take advantage of this program to, to help uh, get you through. <clears throat> uh, right, um, just the other thing to flag here um, is I mentioned disposable PPE uh, in the first category, category one. Um, this category also uh, includes uh, doesn't include disposable, but does include non-disposable. So any kind of uh, PPE that's reusable or that, uh, or medical equipment, um, if you've had to bring, uh, you know, temperature scanners, um, uh, you know, any, anything that uh, if you've, you've brought, uh, had to bring a, a nurse uh, on site and equipment that they've needed to use, that you've needed to purchase, et cetera, um, that, uh, that would also be uh, kind of an example of an eligible expense. Again, these categories are, are pretty broad. Um, there is some definition there, of, of course, in the guidelines, but the really the intent of all of this has been as flexible as possible. Uh, again, to make sure that you know uh, what it is that you need to do on the farm. Um, we ask that you just let us know why this is a COVID expense um, and, uh, and then we go on from there. Oh, there's here, we've got some examples of, uh, of some of those medical expenses. I was blanking for a minute, but washing stations, uh, respirators may be appropriate in some cases, um, sort of safety glasses, those kinds of things. So for those of you uh, who are interested for those first three categories, uh, again, the application forms are available on our website. Um, pretty easy when you go to funding programs to access it, the direct link uh, is here. Um, and uh, certainly if you have any questions specifically about you know, I've had this expense, is it eligible? Feel free to contact the IACC. Um, they can answer all, almost every question, or a contact center. And where they can't, of course, they, they reach out to the program area and, get, and we get you back an answer as quickly as possible. So again, take advantage of, of that resource just to check in if, you're, if you wanna check before, uh, before you go through and do the paperwork. But um, really we're looking at, uh, you know, a relatively broad uh, approach, um, knowing that uh, the, the response is, is very unique from farm to farm. So just finally, um, moving to the, the, the newest category, again, the, the material was uh, released yesterday. Um, 
that material and the application forms have gone directly to the farms that we know uh, have workers who are in this situation. Um, it is always possible that we have missed somebody, um, uh, that there's been some miscommunication between us and farms and, uh, and the federal government and so on in terms of that list. So we do encourage you to reach out if you, if you haven't received something uh, yet. Um, but uh, this is something that applies to you, please get in touch with us um, and then we'll send you something out right away. Um, but uh, um, what this uh, category does is, is it does expand out to, um, to a few expenses and this is done in cooperation with the federal government that might not normally be COVID related direct expenses, but are, are specific to the situation for these stranded temporary foreign workers. So for example, um, uh, your housing uh, may be perfectly safe. You got physical distancing, all of that stuff for the summer months, um, but it's ne it was never designed to be occupied in the winter. Um, and, uh, and there's some additional expenses that you may have to, to keep it up and running in the winter or to, to find alternative accommodations uh, for these folks um, in that situation. So whereas, you know, it's not the health and safety piece, the direct impact is, you know, keeping people warm and not, you know, a COVID necessarily related thing. It is still um, a COVID related expense. It's being driven by, by the COVID situation. And, uh, and we've been able to negotiate that to, to make that available uh, to those farms as well to help cover some of those costs. Again, like the uh, second category, um, for those costs that are eligible, um, we are uh, funding 100%. There is no uh, producer cost share of that. Um, simply, uh, you do have to pay the expense first, like all of these programs, and then you get reimbursed. This, uh, just some examples. Uh, again, I think I've mostly covered this material. Um, you know, similar transportation, meals, um, in some cases, uh, you may have uh, expenses that would be normal uh, uh, over the summer, but might be uh, incrementally higher. Um, and, you know, internet access perhaps is, is something that's come up. So those are the kinds of things that, uh, that we, we are, I've made eligible uh, that might not have been in the other categories uh, for this particular group. So that, um, is, uh, is uh, an overview, uh, certainly available to answer any questions. Again, uh, Susan Collier, uh, there's actually a phone number here, 519-546-5537. Um, if you wanna reach out, if you are uh, in that stranded temporary foreign worker uh, grouping, but you haven't heard from us yet, please reach out. Um, and so that we can make sure that, uh, that you can get the, the paperwork and that you, uh, you can access uh, this program because we, we wanna make sure um, that people are uh, you know, taking advantage of the programs that, that are available and we're providing as much support as possible. Thanks very much, Bradley. And just to introduce Scott now. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for uh, asking us uh, from the ministry to be here this afternoon. I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully it'll come up. In a second here, I just have a couple of slides. Can we, I, can everybody see that? Thanks, Bradley. Um, so I just wanna provide a quick update on the um, housing working group that was uh, created uh, through the ministry and in collaboration with uh, industry and uh, a number of people on the call today were actually involved, um, were involved in the group. Um, the, uh, the, gr the group got its genesis as part of the um, uh, part of the minister's sector leadership group, which uh, was part of, an, and you heard the minister talk about the prevention and control strategy. And so this group provided uh, key uh, input uh, into that. And um, uh, out of that prevention and control strategy, one of the key uh, uh, one of the recommendations uh, out of the 35 that are included in that was to um, look at uh, uh, more immediate housing needs for uh, the agricultural workforce. So uh, the purpose of the um, working group is outlined here. Um, we wanted to make sure we had broad representation and broad um, perspective from agri-food businesses. Uh, 
brought to the table um, to uh, understand any guidance that was being prepared. Um, we wanted to develop interim guidance on materials to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 um, in worker housing uh, in particular. Um, and that included um, examples of adopting best practices, um, providing uh, adaptation of existing structures, um, uh, space and layouts, uh, including physical barriers, and uh, undertaking um, uh, uh, exercises for uh, the provision of social distancing. So um, I'll, I'll speak to the results in a second. The um, other um, requirement, the other purpose of the group was, was to develop and share a directory of companies who were able to supply, uh, whether by building, leasing, or uh, other cost sharing mechanisms, uh, temporary housing solutions uh, that adhere to public guidance um, and the risks of, uh, of COVID, uh, including um, uh, physical distancing. Uh, we wanted to identify solutions and the group was uh, very vocal on explore areas for opportunity and collaboration. And um, we were hoping to, to get through this group also a better understanding of the housing stock that was out there and uh, to get any information that we could um, on uh, the needs going forward. Um, the results to date are um, still under uh, under development, but we're uh, very close to publishing. So we did uh, develop um, um, with the group that uh, that included uh, both uh, industry, healthcare, partner ministries. Um, we did have some agricultural working house recommendations, um, and the purpose of this document is really to further support employers, local public health and other agencies in implementing uh, existing COVID-19 uh, related guidance, in particular for the upcoming growing season. And we also developed the, the, that recommendation. Um, we're going through final approvals um, right now and uh, expect in the very near future once, um, once these documents um, have gone through the the last of the approvals to publish it on the on also the um, the ministry's agri-food sector workforce um, workplace safety toolkit and the link is here on my uh, slides and the minister talked about um, this toolkit so we'll use that as a vehicle to disseminate the information um, also as i'm sure the group today is keenly aware the federal government um, consulted on uh, proposed mandatory requirements for uh, employer um, provided accommodations under under the temporary foreign worker program and um, we uh, we as the as a government asked for input from uh, the housing working group on a response to aid uh, our response to uh, the federal government um, that was due at the end of December and really appreciate the work uh, of the um, of the working group in uh, bringing that all uh, all together. So that's just a, a, cool, a quick update on the um, the purpose, the background, the results, and uh, the status uh, of the work uh, of the working group. So I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Debbie. Thanks very much, Scott, and uh, thank you, Bradley, for uh, providing these important updates. And uh, just a quick reminder to all growers that this information is available on the government's websites, as well as you can refer to uh, your association's website and, and the updates we provide in the newsletters. Um, so thank you very much. And, uh, and I know we're encouraging uh, growers to apply for the funding and, and, uh, and it, they can refer to these, um, the protocols for the funding and, and the, any information. So we also thank you for being accessible and available today, both of you. So I'm now going to um, uh, ask uh, the chair of the Labor Issues Coordinated Committee, Ken Forth. Um, Ken is, uh, works closely with growers um, to develop consensus on employment and labor related issues. And I know LICC is a coalition of agricultural commodity and farm organizations that was developed and formed in 1991 to represent the issues. You couldn't have a, 
a more energetic and, and tireless supporter of our, of our farmers and growers than Ken Forth. And we thank Ken for making the time today and, and welcome Ken, it's uh, over to you. How about now, you hear me okay, Debbie? We do, and we can see you. Okay, I can do a labor issues coordinated update and I can do a quick temporary worker program one if you would like that. Sure. That's very late that's happened. Sure. Okay, thank I'll you. start. I'll start with the temporary worker program first. And first of all, I'd like to thank the minister and, and OMAF for all the initiatives that they put forward to help us this year on, on all the all the programs that they have to help us with with the money. Anyway, if this will not be a long report for the temporary worker program. I'm just going to hit the highlights and the very latest updates. Um, 2020, you never expected this, did you? As you were aware, we, we, the program was suspended last March and due to the efforts of the of farms, OFEJ, CHC, CFA and all provincial commodity groups, we got it reinstated within a couple of weeks. We, we all learned about this virus as we went and we're still learning. There'll be something new tomorrow probably, but I will not go into detail the protocols and demands made to keep our workers and, and, and us safe because most of you know them up to date right now. 2021, the requirements as expected will be more than 2020. Do your best, they're evolving and we learn as we learn about this virus. You've been recognized though as farmers from the Ministry of Labor and OMAP and the public health units and, and the Integrity Branch of Service Canada who said, who said publicly in the national meetings in November that most employers were compliant with the demands made by, by this virus. Housing, that has been an issue that, is, that has brought its head up dramatically this year. There, as Scott just said, there was, there was an OMAP housing committee which farms and, and our, our policy guy um, participated in. But the most important one is, is the federal one that really caused the controversy because the federal one, if you've ever read it, First of all, when, when they approached me about it, they said, we, we're gonna put a housing committee together for consultative process only. We're gonna give you a whole lot of issues and you, we just want you to respond to them. Then somebody put the title across potential requirements. It's not potential requirements. They were just issues they wanted to talk about with doubling the amount of, of bathroom space, et cetera, was gonna cost this industry hundreds of millions of dollars and they didn't intend to do that. They just didn't. So the cost state of process, and they were very, very clear on it that if you know like the cost state of process is for 2021, not to be implemented in 21, but to be but the consultative process to take place in 21. Most of us sent vast amounts of documents into the federal government just before Christmas. So in response to all the issues they had there. So don't be really afraid of that yet. So there's the as far as any new regulations are concerned from the federal government, there simply aren't, aren't any. Just continue to comply with your public health units because they are the ones who can best direct you because they will have protocol in place at, and some of them are different, granted, but they will have the protocol in place long before the government ever puts anything in place and the public health units still have the ball in this one as far as we're concerned in that they will call the shots locally. This, this year in 2021 started with great optimism. Mexico had more workers ready to go than ever before until New Year's Eve when the 72 hour COVID test was announced. All foreign governments were closed of course during the Christmas holidays and there was no chance to organize anything. They have certainly trying and, and they have got a lot of testing done but they, they're certainly trying more than we thought they would and as time progresses we hope that gets better. We've lobbied for 96 and 120 hours, not 72 to response, and mostly due to Mexico. Some Mexican workers must travel 20 hours or more on a bus to get to the airport. So 72 hours just doesn't cut it. They get there and sometimes they're out of sync as far as the timing's concerned. If we had a little longer, we also hope to, we hope, we hope that this resolution is at hand, but and we have lobbied the uh, federal government from every direction, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, Farms, OF and BGA, and commo some commodity groups to change that, that slightly. We're not saying get rid of it, we're changing it, change it slightly. I think even in retrospect, if they had announced on December 15th 
that they were going to do this on January 7th, it would have been a lot more doable than today. When they announced that on, on, on New Year's Eve, basically the first working day back was January the 4th, and they would have had to start testing that day, which they weren't really prepared to do. We, we believe this will get better as we go, but the 72 hours is still going to, going to be an issue. I want to touch now on that on the Trinidad uh, situation that that the previous speaker spoke about, and I thank the Ontario government again for helping us with that Trinidad issue. Apparently, Trinidad workers were asked to sign a document before they left that if the borders were closed in Trinidad, they might not get back. We didn't really know about that about the extent of that document till recently, but we've been trying to get people back all fall, and nobody was listening to us. It was a Trinidad government only that would that were restricting them to go back. Now we have a process in place where we can get that 72 hour test, but it's through, it, it's through the Ministry of Health and through OMAF where we contact OMAF as soon as we get, have that test taken and they kind of make it a priority with the Ministry of Health to get that test back in 72 hours so we can get these folks home. But these planes don't happen overnight. They happen about 10 days apart because we must fly on Caribbean Airlines, which is owned by the Trinidad government. By the end of this month, we hope most folks will be back. The bottom line is there are many people here, folks, and this is a very short thing about this, about temporary worker program, because I, I want to focus on LICC. Bottom line is there are many folks in this thing who have your back. Farms, especially Sue Williams, she does an extraordinary job there. I don't know that she had any day off last year except Christmas Day. Staff and board of directors there, the OF and BGA, Allison, Bill George, and Gordon Stock, and, and, and the rest of the staff there, especially Stefan Ross who is, has a labor file and, has, and we formed a good team to address labor issues, both LICC and, and the SOP program. Federally, we're partnered with the CFA and the CHC on federal labor issues. This is not part time, but every day. And I hope that everybody realized there's a lot of work in this and there's a lot of people, you know, poking the bear every, every day to try to make it better for you. The introduction you gave to us, uh, Debbie, about, about LICC is true. It was put in place in 1991 to basically fight the unions. The unions wanted to unionize agriculture, and I won't go into a lot of history on that. But LICC in the, in the, in the later years has turned into anything to do with employment law. And, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is yet another attack by the United Food and Commercial Workers Union who just don't give it up. As you know, since 2002 or three, we've had a, a, a labor law in Ontario called the Agriculture Labor Relate, the Agriculture Employee Protection Act. It was put in place to address the Dunsmore decision in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court recognized in, in our defeat of the UFCW on that case, because they wanted to unionize farm workers, that farm workers in Ontario did have the rights of every other Canadian worker here. But the, 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 the Supreme Court asked the Ontario government to come up with a document that absolutely said that, that agriculture workers are covered by this, that, and the other thing. And so they did. It's called the Agriculture Employee Protection Act. It was put in by Helen Johns, and it is a, it is a, uh, a, labor, doc, or a labor law that is housed within the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs. It's the only, uh, it's the only labor act that is housed outside the MOL. But the union didn't like it because the, the, the Supreme Court said, and we all knew, but the Supreme Court said that the decision and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms challenge did not extend to institutional rights. It certainly extends to right of association. Right of association means you can join anything you want to, any, public, any, any political party, any church, any union, anything. You can join it but it did not extend to institutional rights. And institutional rights are called, uh, an example of that is collective bargaining. Without a doubt, workers on your farm can strike. If they don't like the way you're doing things, they just won't come out of the bunkhouse every day or come to your farm that day until things are resolved. It's there. The only thing that's not there is, is that you will not have a worker represented by a union coming to your farm. So recently, we, so we went through Dunsmore, we went through Fraser in the attack of the AEPA that cost us almost $800,000 to be interveners in that case. We won that case hands down in around 2009. 
And now the union's back again through a marijuana firm now owned by Aurora. It's called, it was called the Medleaf case. In that case, we, it starts off in, a, in the AEPA tribunal. The tribunal considered LICC evidence as important context for its analysis. Evidence of LICC's fact witnesses, including myself, Jan Vanderhout, and Amy Cronin, was, was, was expressly relied on in underscoring the importance of LICC's role in achieving this favorable outcome. And we did get a favorable outcome, but it took a lot longer because of the COVID. It, it was announced in June of this past year that we won. The tribunal found, in fact, that the union, the UFCW, is dogmatic, narrowly focused on organizing workers under the combative Wagner model, which seeks to resolve workplace disputes through strikes. Very 30 seconds on the Wagner stru structure. The Wagner Act technically is an American Labor Act. It was put in in the 1940s to address unfair practices by employers. But it may, the Wagner Act is violent. It's it's, it's argumentative, it's aggressive on both sides, especially the union side. And the Wagner Act, by the way, the Wagner structure of unionization is only used in North America. Europe doesn't use this. Europe is more of a compromise situation. If you go on strike in Canada and the United States, the Wagner Act dictates that you must hate one another, more or less. And so that's where the Wagner Act, we don't like it. And, and that's where the union wanna go. The tribunal further found that the UFCW was actively, actively undermining the Agriculture Employee Protection Act and has misled workers through its website about their rights. Basically, this, law, this last lawsuit, the UFCW want to strip agriculture workers of their rights so they can re revert back to an industrial setting. These are remarkable findings showcasing the bad faith nature of the union's approach to this issue. The tribunal confirmed that the previous legal case, Fraser, which LICC also successfully intervened in, is, is binding law and no substantial development has occurred since Fraser to change. The tribunal confirmed that the AEPA is an appropriate labor relations model for agriculture that meets the requirements of Section 2D of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We respect, in respect to the right to strike, the tribunal agreed with LICC that there's no constitutional requirement for any province to have an explicit law that gives workers the right to strike. To be clear, AEPA does not prohibit strikes and agriculture workers have a great deal of economic leverage if they wish to withdraw their labor. All, all of this is viewed as a great win for LICC, Ontario's Ministry of Attorney General, the Attorney General basically is a defendant in this case because it was a chief lawmaker in the province. LIC's contribution clearly proved to be impactful. Our evidence and legal arguments were all adopted by the tribunal. So we won big time. UFCW are not very satisfied with that. So now in, they, have, they have declared that they're gonna take us to court and we will be in, in divisional court in Ontario in June, around June 14th of 2021. That is the first step. If we get, if, if we win there, we go to the Court of Appeal, if the Court of Appeal will hear it, because that's the criteria to go to the Court of Appeal is that you have to present your case that there was some wrongdoing in divisional court that would, that would make it appropriate to rehear the case. If it gets to the Court of Appeal and that's done there, the, person, the people that lose that case can apply to the Supreme Court of Canada to be heard same criteria they look at it and say was there some something wrong in this case that that gave an unfair judgment then we'll hear it so if we get to the supreme court of canada folks that will be sometime around 2025 or 26 and wait for it it'll be to be interveners in that case it costs between 800 thousand and one million dollars the same as the last time so Debbie, that's the only thing I have to say now. I, I have to say that the LICC and its legal team are preparing the hearings for June. And we have a great deal of backup in this. LICC is, is, is uh, we have a board of directors of the commodity groups. We also have uh, an executive committee and we all also have uh, Stefan LaRoss, who is my partner in crime on this one. And we work tirelessly at this case.
So that's sorry to be long winded, Debbie, but that's what I. No, it's great, Ken. Thank you as always, and uh, I would agree and concur that uh, Ken, um, you have done such a super job for us. But uh, Stefan and Gordon and others, I know, have worked tirelessly to 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 sort of at your back to be there to support you as well. So thanks again. Um, last but not least, uh, the, the presentation today is from the Ontario Ministry of Health. Um, Melissa Helferty is the manager of the in the Infectious Diseases Policy and Programs Unit and has been with the ministry for the last eight years. Melissa joins us today to provide an update on COVID-19 on uh, Ontario Farms. Melissa, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Debbie. And just want to confirm that you can see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I think we can all agree that this pandemic has had a significant impact on farm operators and employees, and we are learning constantly how to better protect ourselves and our communities as we continue responding to this pandemic. Today, I'd like to provide you with an overview of public health measures to prevent COVID transmission or reduce transmission in the agricultural sector. What to expect from public health should an outbreak be declared, resources, and some next steps. So let's begin with some public health measures. As you're all aware, this is our second agricultural season responding to this pandemic. This slide outlines how the virus spreads and symptoms. However, I would like to flag that the symptom list has grown since the same time last year. The evidence has shown that COVID presents with a variety of symptoms, and we recommend paying attention to all types of symptoms should you notice yourselves, your families, or workers becoming ill. Last year, we did have a number of farm workers with severe illness, including three deaths and four nationals. This shows where we are um, across the country with this pandemic. As you're all aware, uh, Ontario had our first case of COVID in January of 2020, and the World Health Organization declared a pandemic in March of 2020. We are in our second wave now, and unfortunately with this wave, we have seen much more community transmission, many more outbreaks, and severe illness. Our current case count is again very different this time um, than the same time last year or even last February and March. We are now in lockdowns. Um, we have another provincial emergency that's just been declared and all with the intent of slowing transmission and reducing the impact of the pandemic on our province and our healthcare system. As previously mentioned by other speakers, the federal government now also requires a negative test within 72 hours of arrival into Canada, which us as provinces and communities have to work with. So these are key ways to prevent transmission. However, with lessons learned so far during this pandemic, maintaining physical distancing as much as possible and cohorting or grouping people together so that they only have uh, very limited contact with the same people ensures that if one person in that group or cohort become ill, the remaining people um, have to self-isolate, um, but not hundreds or dozens of people. So again, maintaining that physical distancing and or co cohorting or grouping uh, where possible is a key prevention strategy, especially when uh, looking at farm operations. So how to protect yourselves on farms. Under the Federal Quarantine Act, any individual arriving in Canada must quarantine for 14 days. This is a federal requirement, uh, which they enforce. This has not changed since last year and the requirements remain the same. In addition, public health plays a role with inspections and outbreak management. Your public health unit will be in touch to discuss isolation plans and ensure there's an appropriate setup within the farm to promote good health and wellness, uh, and that measures are in place to reduce transmission as much as possible. We do ask that if you have a sick employee, uh, to please notify your health unit or seek medical attention early on to avoid severe illness. So 
So moving on, uh, how to protect workers on a farm. So working on a farm, uh, again, physical distancing is very much um, a key prevention strategy. We also have uh, the cohorting that I previously mentioned. Signage and active screening is very important as well. You can ask each and every individual on the farm on a daily basis, do you have symptoms? And be very specific around um, asking them and not just uh, relying on them to uh, tell you if they are ill. Uh, enhance cleaning and disinfection practices, which you are all familiar with given your experience of last year. Uh, ensure workers stay on the farm as much as possible. Uh, this reduces the uh, community interaction. So if your farm is COVID free and you have employees going out into community, uh, they have increased exposure, especially right now, given our community rates of transmission are so high. And we do recommend uh, limit to work locations uh, so that you have employees that only work on one farm if possible. Uh, this also prevents further transmission between farms. Um, and reduces the exposure of employees uh, as they go into the community. And testing. So farm workers can get tested uh, at either pharmacies or assessment centers. Whether they have symptoms or not, uh, as this sector has been listed as a priority for testing uh, within the Ministry of Health. So again, anyone who works on farms, uh, it doesn't matter what type of farm, um, but they can get tested at either pharmacies or assessment centers. So should you have a positive COVID case on a farm, your local public health unit will be in touch. Um, if there is a case, um, the medical officer of health or delicate will or may declare an outbreak, depending on how many cases and where they're located. The public health unit will come in and do their investigation. They will ask um, who else has been in contact with the sick individual, um, what they did, where they worked, uh, where they lived, and for all purposes around case and contact management. So they wanna reduce the exposure to other individuals as much as possible. The public health unit may also facilitate testing. Um, they would work with you around isolating exposed workers and provide any additional guidance that they may, um, that they may feel is needed to implement um, safety measures to reduce transmission. As we heard, Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development, as well as OMAFRA would be part of the outbreak investigation. And depending on the scope and severity of the outbreak, there are a few options that could be the result of this outbreak being declared. Loss of farm production operations, especially if you have large cohorts of individuals who now have to isolate for 14 days. Partial closure of the farm for up to two weeks or more. Again, if there are a number of sick individuals that have to isolate mm -hmm. and then workplace related severity or death. So return to operations after an outbreak will happen with collaboration from your public health unit. They will look at ongoing mitigation strategies that could be in place to reduce transmission. They would work with you if, um, if more cohorting or if other prevention measures need to be in place to reduce transmission and to ensure your farm operations. The Temporary Foreign Worker Program is supported by a number of local, provincial, and federal legislations and acts. This slide outlines authorities to issue fines and penalties at the different levels of government. And this is for your awareness. One thing I would like to flag and from the public health side is that the local public health unit is, which is the uh, medical officer of health, has the authority to issue orders under the Health Protection and Promotion Act. If you do not know your representative at the public health unit who inspects farms, then I would encourage you to build that relationship prior to an outbreak occurring. This slide just lists some resources that may be of benefit to you and your farms and employees. Many of these documents have been discussed today. And then just terms and next steps. So us as at the Ministry of Health and Public Health, 
Uh, we continue to work very closely with OMAPRA and Ministry of Labor, uh, and we continue to work on all aspects of the OMAPRA prevention toolkit, as well as with our local public health units. So we do have documents and training sessions and information sessions available for our health units to try and ensure some consistency across the different health units of how they respond to uh, cases of COVID and outbreak management on all farms, including the agricultural sector. And as previously mentioned by a speaker, we are, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, vaccines have now started to roll out in Ontario. We have, we administer around 14,000 doses per day. We have administered approximately or just over 159,000 doses and just over 13,000 people have received both doses uh, in the past month. So that is being rolled out as quickly as possible. And that information is also on our website. And lastly, I'm happy to answer any questions or take questions back because there are a variety of different areas within the Ministry of Health uh, and within the three different ministries at the provincial level who support temporary foreign workers and farm operations. Um, but on behalf of myself and uh, my team, we wanted to say thank you for all your work to reduce the impact of COVID. I, we are aware that it has definitely been a challenge uh, on farms and to your uh, communities. Um, but also we wanted to say thank you as you are ensuring our food supply in Ontario. So thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm not sure if I'm being heard or not. It's Kathy McKay speaking. Yes, we hear you, Kathy. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks for a very informative presentation today. And thank you to all of the speakers who are helping us as farmers to plan and be prepared for a second challenging season. By attending today, you're starting the planning process and probably this isn't your first day at it. Uh, to ensure a safe workplace on your farm. Now we'll take questions and Sarah Marshall will be in charge of the questions. And um, all I can say is have a safe and great season. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, some of the questions uh, are being answered and have been answered as we have gone along. So I'm gonna do a review of those for those of you who haven't been paying attention to the Q&A section and a few more have come in since then. But before I start that, just to um, go to one that was uh, submitted prior uh, to these sessions. And I'm gonna direct this question um, to, to Melissa. And just to let the um, person that sent that question know that the full, the full uh, email was sent to Melissa, but uh, I'll just summarize the question. Uh, considering the migrant workers are required uh, to have a negative COVID test before uh, flying to Canada, why is there no cap on the cycle threshold of the test? And more importantly, why is it not being recorded or even revealed with each positive test? And then uh, just a request from this grower uh, requesting that the cycle thresholds used in each positive test are included with the results and are given to both the individual tested and employer. So if Melissa, you could uh, um, take this question. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not an answer that I can provide. Um, I will flag this to our federal colleagues uh, because that is a policy and a regulation, a change that they made under the Federal Quarantine Act. But I will, I will uh, share this question with them. And now I'll just review some of those questions uh, that are in the answered. Everyone should be able to see the question and answers. Um, so in the answered section, uh, there, was, uh, there was a question that I uh, answered privately from uh, Isabel um, about flagging any significant regional differences um, from the first uh, presentation from Niagara Health. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, Isabel, you got some more clarification with the uh, the overall uh, presentation from Melissa. So let us know if there's something additional you needed to know. I will say that there's section 22 orders 
um, for each individual health unit. So it might be best to refer back to your individual health unit and any section 22 orders that exist. Um, secondly, um, uh, Bradley Shaw answered the question about uh, the uh, February cutoff date on the um, Enhanced Worker Protection Funding Program. So unfortunately, uh, it does not at this uh, time extend past February 26th. That's the provincial and federal authorities for that. And uh, Bradley uh, assures uh, those that ask that uh, type of question that they are um, sharing and discussing that with decision makers. A couple of questions were asked about the temporary foreign worker isolation period for 14 days. Will their isolation pay be covered by this wage program? Uh, it's not through the province. It is uh, through the federal government. It uh, is currently still in place for 2021 up until arrivals to March 31st. And that connects with the, the federal quarantine um, act and when that's in place. So once we come closer to that date, um, I'm sure there'll be discussions about it uh, extending that further. Uh, there was a question from Isabel about going forward into 2021, 2022 with that uh, funding. Again, uh, discussions on that to, to uh, extend past the current fiscal year will continue. Uh, Steve Horley had a question um, based uh, directly on his submission and Bradley will uh, do some follow up with him directly. Uh, the question about uh, directory of companies able to supply housing. Uh, Bradley's going to take that back to other experts in the ministry to follow up with a response to our organizations. I believe uh, just um, uh, from my perspective, I thought there was um, a resource on at least modular housing units that was available uh, that had been developed, but I'll leave that with Bradley. Uh, Isabel had a question, the target date to the uh, OMAFRA toolkit, the launch for that. Um, oh, I'm having difficulty showing all the questions. Uh, Bradley responded to that. The toolkit is a, lot, a living document and provided the link. And uh, I'm sure the, uh, all the associations will get uh, communications out on that, uh, on that as well. Uh, so that's the ones that have already answered the open uh, section, which we'll uh, deal with now. Uh, from Steve, uh, will temporary foreign workers be given access to vaccine? I think I'll put that over to Melissa if she could uh, respond to that one. And Leslie Huffman had the same question. Thank you. Not a problem. I've just opened up the, uh, the open questions and answers and I see that there are a few around vaccine. So I'll try my best to address these. Um, right now, we are receiving vaccine from the federal government uh, on a week by week basis. We have enough um, to do the initial rollout, um, but because we don't have enough vaccine for any Ontarian right now or anyone in our province who would like to receive vaccine, we do have a list of priority populations. So right now that is focused around long-term care, retirement, acute care residents and uh, staff members that support those sectors. As we do receive more vaccine uh, from both Pfizer and Moderna, and as more vaccines become licensed in Canada, we have a vaccine task force that is being led by General Hillier, and him and his team will identify other priority groups um, for to receive the vaccination. So we have already requested uh, temporary foreign workers to be considered as one of the following uh, priority populations and priority groups. Once we have the additional vaccine, so we will keep you posted um, once, once we're at that stage. And then there is a question here, will members who have tested positive before be exempt from vaccines? Currently, even those who have received, or sorry, who have tested positive for COVID, they are eligible to receive that vaccine. Um, we are not declining anyone uh, who has tested positive to not receive the vaccine. And that has been shown in the safety data that it is safe for somebody who has a, a positive COVID test to receive the vaccine. And I think Melissa, are you able to answer the one from Bruna? Please make a list available of all organizations that need to be notified in case of an outbreak. Is that included in your presentation or? No, it's not, but that is actually a great suggestion um, because there is uh, OMAFRA and Ministry of Labor and uh, Public Health. Uh, so we can, we can do that. 
and organizations can also make that uh, a part of their um, communications out to growers as well. Yeah, that would be, that's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, another question coming in from Tom Wiley. What rights does the farmers have regarding visitors coming onto their properties unannounced? It's hard to keep the guys isolated. Do we need signage regarding quarantine? Melissa, does that fall under you or would somebody else uh, like to answer that question? I can attempt it. I think it's also a question for Ministry of Labor, um, who has uh, a lot of oversight around the occupational health and safety. Uh, signage on your farm um, is a great idea to, especially if you are an outbreak or if you are in a situation where you do not want to have visitors. Um, or you can have sign at the at the beginning of the driveway saying this is um, a COVID free zone or we are currently in outbreak and do not proceed on the farm property unless you call in advance, make an appointment, or even if you have a phone number on the sign that they can call um, before stepping on your property. We have seen that, uh, especially around some of the farms that uh, are in mink, that are, are mink farms, just given uh, COVID transmission on mink farms is quite high and there have been a lot of different uh, outbreaks in those communities overseas. So that is that is um, a process that they have put in place. Ken, did you have anything to add? You're on mute. Okay, I'm there. Okay, um, yeah, there, there's a couple things. Um, as you know, the, the Ontario government did put in place protection and it wasn't only for for animal rights activists it was put in for activists of any kind for access to your property besides the fact the property is yours and no matter what and and people got really up in arms about that federal document as far as um uh, the housing was concerned that that it said in there that all the general public will have access to your farm like heck they will it's your farm it's your families it's your guys and you got to protect them. I mean, we have signs everywhere on farms now for no trespassing because we don't want people on there. And it's against the Trespass Act. If, if somebody wants to just come on there and do whatever they think they're going to do, visit your workers in isolation, they're in violation of the Trespass Act. Like that, that's where your protection is. Thanks, Ken. Bruno had a follow up on his uh, on his question about notification. What about notifying Service Canada and the uh, the consulate? In this case, his example is the Mexican consulate. When there's a t when there's somebody that uh, is there an outbreak? Um, so, yeah, I can provide a response to that. Um, we, as a government, are very um, uh, routinely in touch with consulates. We work with the federal government as well as uh, the consulates within Ontario, Canada, and overseas. So, for example, when we had the deaths of the three temporary foreign workers from Mexico, we had a lot of engagement with them. Um, they are very interested in knowing the circumstances of outbreaks in Ontario and how it impacts their nationals. So that is something that uh, we have been making those connections and affiliations with some of the consulates. I am aware of uh, some other health units who have really relied on consulates, uh, including the Mexican consulate within their area, if they needed support um, to either get temporary foreign workers back home or um, to have engagement with them to renew visas or to because of medical expenses. So uh, we do that and you as a farm and association uh, can also reach out to the public health unit and the consulate. I guess I'll, I'll do a follow up uh, to Ken. Is it a requirement for the grower to notify Service Canada and the consulate if there's an outbreak? Cer certainly the consulate, but I think it's appropriate to, um, to, to let Service Canada know too. They're going to find out sooner than later. You may as well let them know. But certainly the consulate or the liaison services should be notified. One other thing, though, Debbie, I have to say, and it does not diminish the fact that somebody died. It does. Every death's a tragedy. doesn't matter what. But one of those workers of those three 
was not in any of the programs that's administered by the Canadian government or by farmers. He was here on a visitor's visa. That's all. He didn't come in under the SOP program or the Ag Stream program. It does not diminish the death. But let's not put him, but let's say there was a death on a farm, and there was. There was two deaths on the temporary worker program. Two. Not three, two. Not mincing words here, but that's just the way things are. So, thank you. Okay, so we're, uh, we do have a hard stop at 1.30, so there's about three minutes remaining. So if there's any uh, other questions, we may have time for one more, and then I'll uh, put it over to Debbie for closing remarks. Okay, seeing no other questions, I'll put it over to Debbie. Thank you very much, Sarah. And I just want to take a moment to thank Sarah and uh, Kelly Cicerin and and from the Great Growers of Ontario, Jillian, who put a ton of work into this um, and, and pulling everyone to together as well as Mary Jane Combe. So I want to thank all of you. Um, this is a, a very, it's been a very uh, good presentation. The webinar and all of the presentations will be up online on all our sites. So you can go back and revisit if you need more information, but also encourage you to, um, you know, through your association, if there's any follow-up that you have or any further questions, we'd be happy to answer them. But thank you again to all the presenters today. Um, without you and your cooperation, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this, but we also want to thank you for your assistance as we get through these, uh, as everybody's heard this word over and over again, challenging times, but it's 2021. So we're hoping as the vaccine rolls out that we'll be um, back to normal in no time, uh, fingers crossed. Thanks again, everyone for being here today and uh, look forward to, to following up. If there's any other questions, happy to take those uh, offline and uh, thanks again. Thanks for the opportunity, Debbie. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.